Good morning, everyone. Um, well, the question that was set for me was a simple one. Um, is the British planning system failing us? Um, well, I'm actually going to talk about the English planning system to start with, because there's more than one planning system in the country, and that's the one on which uh, I'm going to focus. They are different. Um, sadly, I think the evidence would suggest that the, the, the English planning system is failing us, um, and is doing so in many respects. I do offer this perspective from a, from a personal point of view, nearly 30 years in the business of planning, um, and I've also gained a much wider perspective from being one of the 11 uh, Rainsford Review Task Force members who took on the challenge last year of examining the state of the English planning system. It turned out to be no small task and uh, took us on a journey that I don't think any of us were quite expecting. Um, I know that as uh, the not-so-light interlude between presentations packed full of lovely pictures of European cities, the best of the Cambridge Fringe, and trams gliding through city streets, I'm a bit on, out on a limb here in, in, in sort of raising a battle cry for planning. I was offered the opportunity to change the title and try and put a more positive spin on the presentation today, but in the end I decided that the answer had to be answered straight. Sorry, the question had to be answered straight. I do this for two reasons. We're not going to be able to deliver the challenge of one million homes in the Oxford to Cambridge corridor without a radical change in the approach that we adopt. The processes and institutions of planning are not, at the moment, fit for the task. If I stand here and tell you that strengthening design codes or taking another look at Freiburg will make all the difference, you won't believe me. We have an immense pool of talent in this country, and we know very well how to plan and design beautiful places. Our challenge is to make the exception the norm, and to do so in the green fields, in this location, and in the inner city of this very town that we're standing in. I'm optimistic. This is not a business as usual. And in facing up to what we need to do to deliver the ambitions for the corridor, we will have to rekindle and reinvent the institution of planning. We've stepped outside the broken system to get to the ball rolling with the work of the NIC. But what next? Let's work it out and let's transform the planning system for the good of the nation while we're at it. I'm not going to talk too much about design either. Beautiful places are just one of the many desirable outcomes of an effective process of planning. I'm going to focus on the fundamentals. The rest will follow. First, I think it's important to be clear that I am talking about the pl planning in its broadest scope as it operates across all aspects of sustainable development. Planning is uh, concerned with how we organise ourselves to meet the challenges faced by society. The town and country planning regime applies this concept to development, but from inception, the idea of planning for development went far beyond the built environment. Planning systems have evolved to have potential to have profound impacts on all aspects of the way people live their lives. The players in the system today are many, and their motivations and perspectives are as complex and as nuanced as the practice of planning itself. There are many private sector interests, so-called, that depend on and value the system, as there are public sector interests who fail to see that planning is an instrument designed to protect the public interest. As a result, the job of planning has become highly complex and multidisciplinary. In essence, the job of the planner is to understand and arbitrate across a myriad of needs and challenges. Successful planning is the achievement of a carefully balanced settlement between competing interests. We must reflect upon planning's considerable and extraordinary achievements. The national parks, the new towns, building conservation, urban containment, there are many. There are also many examples of outstanding planning practice occurring right now. And they do so often, unfortunately, despite the system or by adopting clever manoeuvres around it. Because planning embraces something of everything, it's a ready scapegoat for virtually all the woes of society. Easier to blame the planners than to support them in the near impossible task of dealing with the tension between growth and sustainable development. Furthermore, planning of late has become a pawn in a power struggle between central and local governments. It's one of the victims of the increasing lack of trust in experts, only now ever really referred to as so-called experts, and is weak, in a weakened state. It's the target for increasingly mobilised and dissatisfied communities. No surprise then, that there are a long queue of people standing ready to beat the planning piñata with a very big stick, and what falls out are few sweet treats, just a stream of vilification. 
All parties complain about the time it takes to navigate the system, the goalposts being forever on the move and uncertainty. Businesses and investors sort of deride slow and bureaucratic processes, often superficial. Communities are bewildered and feel ignored or excluded. Councillors often feel powerless or carry their responsibility to make really difficult decisions far too lightly. As for planners, well, I'm afraid many of them are in a pretty sorry state. Ridiculed, bullied, isolated. I could go on. It's not entirely fair that your town hall planner, and in some town halls I'm afraid to say there is only one left, I think, should that, that, that lonely planner should be uh, sort of accountable for all of these problems. A lack of political vision, short-termism, and the decisions we make as a society about priorities and investment are not planning matters. So, just a moment on the process of planning. As the pendulum has swung between competing interests, government has torn strips off the planning process and endlessly tinkered with it. The system, as it is now covered, the system is now covered in sticking plasters. The Rainsford report catalogues quite well the maelstrom. 15 major changes in legislation and process, process since 2000 alone. The system, as we now have it, and the many institutions engaged in planning are more complex than ever before. Forget your Sudoku. If you want a real brain teaser, try and draw a diagram of how the English planning system works. We had a go in the Rainsford Review, and this was about the best that we can do, and I don't think it captures probably 20 to 30% of what's going on. What is even more interesting is to consider whether all of these layers of complexity have actually made a real difference. What have they achieved? Are they delivering the sort of better outcomes for people that we all want and need? I think not. Planning as a creative endeavour to better people's lives is now in so many places out on the margins. Forward planning and policy making is sinking fast and the reach of the planner has narrowed, especially alarmingly, in those areas where effective decision making is most urgently needed. I would include within that design in tackling climate change, in dealing with the ageing population, and in helping increasingly, and helping increasingly an unhealthy population. I think this is a good slide just to demonstrate that point, certainly in relation to the design matter. This captures uh, a bit of information about the way in which local authorities are, are using design standards to try and better design quality. You see there in 2013 that there were a number of them adopting various different codes and standards to try and drive up design quality. By 2016, there's a mere two still got that within their, their process of monitoring and capturing the outcomes of planning. And of course, planning has, as a public service has been subject to the largest cuts of any local government function. It's an easy target as it does not carry with it any statutory obligations and the consequences of planning um, are not really readily attribu attributable when they're no longer effective. In the round, planning is now a system with a conflicted purpose, operating with a complicated and overlapping structure, and is rarely valued by those whose lives it is, planning, it is meant to improve. By any measure, I think that's a fail. So what are the prospects? With no focus on outcomes and crisis over purpose, a failing system stands a good chance of being dismantled or allowed to crumble away. The obvious, the obvious question in light of that is whether or not the planning system fading away really matters. I'm a firm believer that it absolutely does. The extent and the outcomes arising from the expansion of permitted development rights already mentioned this morning reveal the real risks of dismantling the planning system. And let's be clear, the conversion of commercial buildings to residential use is a monumental failing despite the good examples. It is not indicative of a missed opportunity to make lives a little bit better. It is a neglect of the most basic of human rights. The horror stories are now at least grabbing headlines, so I'm not going to dwell on the detail here, and it has already been mentioned this morning, but safe to say if the 13 square metre apartment here, single studio, is something that uh, is a little bit too small for you, you can have a double one next door for, for 17 metres square in the same building. And of course, there's no finer example of the planning pendulum swinging than the fact that the Building Better, Building Beautiful campaign was launched the same week as plans to extend these permitted development rights were also published by government. There will probably be more of the same coming to a high street near you soon, unless the outcomes of the research that we, uh, we had mentioned earlier leads to a change of heart. 
I sat with my son last weekend, revising for his history exam, drilling facts into him about those living in the Victorian slums. Families crammed into one room, unable to see the sky, unable to breathe in clean air, or to block out the noise from the brothel next door. I realise that we're in danger of coming full circle. The English planning system came into being to right those sorts of wrongs. And if we don't rescue it now, we'll have to reinvent it for sure in the pretty near future. So where do we go next? There is clear evidence and principal justification for an effective planning system to act in the public interest. We must step back and reinvent planning with purpose to deliver for society in the round and then allow it to settle and then shield it from the political ping pong. There are 24 detailed recommendations in the Rainsford re report, which I, I thoroughly recommend you pick up and read. They are the, the blueprint for reinventing planning. Um, I take from these that we need to clearly define the purpose of planning. We need a legal duty to deliver sustainable development. That legal obligation needs to rest upon the planning process. We need to simplify the structure of planning. It needs to have tiers of national, regional and local decision making and sub-regional planning if necessary. It needs special vehicles to do the things that we also need to do in places like the corridor where the challenge is great. We need to stimulate cross-sector dialogue about the challenges and value of planning. Harnessing technology and investing in new ways to stimulate a national debate about the needs of society. We have a good record of it in here, uh, here in Milton Keynes, and we are certainly standing here with opportunity to spread that across the arc. We need to introduce a new kind of powerful local plan, a positive local plan that is dealt with quickly and efficiently and serves the purpose of then removing much of the debate that follows in the subsequent layers of planning. We need to strengthen local governance and empower local authorities. They need to be engaged directly in delivering development in the same way as we've heard about in Rotterdam this morning. We, we need to introduce a new community covenant, clear enhanced rights and accountability. Most importantly, and certainly of most interest to the audience here, we need to secure standards and minimum outcomes, including a duty to meet housing need and a duty for planners to operate under a strengthened ethical code. This is the key to raising design standards and tackling the big issues of climate change. There is also a need to introduce reforms to land taxation and to the redistribution of revenues arising. Um, not something for today, but a massive, massive issue and a massive driver for quality in itself. And last and vitally, we need to re-energise, we need to respect and we need to upskill the planning profession to do what we need to do. Taken together, these changes provide the foundations of a simpler, fairer system that will help improve decision making. When we can be clear about what we now want planning to do for our communities, we can hold planners to account fairly and they can take genuine pride in taking tough decisions but delivering beneficial outcomes. Thank you very much.